Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Don't we have some teachers in the room? All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bridget Terry Long, and I'm very, very proud to be the Dean of the Harvard Graduate School of Education. I am joined here on stage with several of my HGSE colleagues, as well as our esteemed speakers for this afternoon, who I will introduce as the ceremony continues. Together, it is our pleasure to welcome you all to the 2019 Convocation Ceremony, especially the 740 students who will be graduating tomorrow. Congratulations. <laughs> Convocation is an important moment to recognize many of the individuals who have contributed to the HGSE community this year. Today's ceremonies will begin with the presentation of the Morning Star Award for Excellence in Teaching, followed by the presentation of our Intellectual Contribution Awards, the Marshall Awards, the Phyllis Strimling Award, and then we will hear from the student and faculty speakers, after which we will present the 2019 class gift and this year's Alumni Award. Our featured speaker for today is HCSE alumna, Deborah Beal, founder and president of the Posse Foundation. And after she concludes, I'll just have a few final announcements before we're off to the block party. So to begin, it is my great pleasure to present an important annual award recognizing a member of our faculty for excellence in teaching. The Morningstar Family Teaching Award was established in 2000 with a gift from Faith Morningstar, an HGSE, HGSE alumna, and her husband, the Honorable Richard Morningstar, an alumnus of the college. Faith's experience here as a student inspired her and her family to create an award that would not only recognize the excellence a great teaching that is here, but also those faculty members who help create a supportive environment for our students. Liz, a member of the Morningstar family, is here today. Please join me in thanking her and her family for the supporting teaching here at HGSE. The Morningstar recipient is chosen each year based on nominations from, by HCSE students. The award includes a monetary prize as well as recognition on a plaque in Longfellow Hall behind us. This year, 196 students uh, submitted nominations for a total of 60 faculty members. This outpouring of praise is a testament to the attention members of this community place on teaching and mentorship. And while it's never easy to choose just one, one faculty member this year really stood out. I'd like to share a few excerpts from the nominations for this year's winner. This faculty member was, play, was praised for his ability to convey challenging concepts. One student wrote, under his wing I have developed a newfound confidence in a skill that seemed unattainable when I first arrived. Students also shared this person created a warm and inclusive classroom environment. One student wrote, his personality, meaning his sense of humor, his wacky t-shirts, his general humility, always made classes enjoyable, even when the content felt inaccessible. Another student noted, when I think of him, I think of generosity. And finally, another student concluded, without a doubt, he is the most dedicated professor I have had my entire academic career. Without, much further, without further ado, I am very delighted to share this year's Morning Star, Star Award winner is Joe McIntyre. Oh, 
always humble. He just wanted to sit down. <laughs> but I wanted to make sure you had a moment to recognize him. Moving to the Intellectual Contribution Awards. For the 13th consecutive year, HGSC is recognizing a student from each master's program with an Intellectual Contribution Award. Master students were given the opportunity to nominate a fellow student, the person who most inspired their learning and intellectual inquiry over the course of the year. These lists of nominated students were then reviewed by the master's program faculty directors who selected the honorees. I'm very pleased to announce the 13 recipients of the 2019 Intellectual Contribution Award. As I read each student's name, she or he will step forward to receive a certificate and a gold honor cord to be worn tomorrow at commencement. The inscription on the certificate reads, in recognition of your academic achievement and your contribution to the academic life of HGSC as nominated by your student peers and the HGSC faculty. For the Arts and Education Program, Ashley Hunker. I think you keep walking. From, from Education Policy and Management, Delresha White. From Higher Education, Yurami Okai. From Human Development and Psychology, Constantine Ofer. From International Education Policy, Sarah Osborne. From Language and Literacy, Caitlin Wingert. From Learning and Teaching, Demarius Altamirianos. From Mind, Brain, and Education, Kara Solomon. From Prevention, Science, and Practice, Lisa Nam. From School Leadership, Brian Bradley. From Special Studies, Emily Ramos. From Teacher Education, Nathan Whitfield. And from Technology, Innovation, and Education, Dahlia Abbas. Once again, congratulations to you all. And it is now my pleasure to present the 2019 Commencement Marshals. Commencement Marshals are elected by their peers for their leadership, for their involvement in the HCSE community, and for their commitment to service. They are honored as exemplary role models and representatives of the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Two marshals are elected for each of the graduating EDD and EDLD classes. One marshal is elected for the CAS program, one for the HTF program, and one for each of the 13 master's programs. I'm definitely gonna want you guys to be cheering a lot like that tomorrow. So 
Get ready. Save your voices. So as I read, read again each student's name, she or he will step forward to receive the Marshall's medallion to be worn tomorrow at commencement. And the two EDD Marshalls are Deepa Vasudevan and Elizabeth Edelman. Thank you. And the two EDLD marshals are Shirley Vargas and Crystal Ward. And the marshal for the Certificate of Advanced Study is Alexandra Squarzella. For the Arts and Education Program, Camilla Mahamud. <laughs> for Education Policy and Management, Langley Elman. For the Harvard Teacher Fellows Program, Reuben Howard. For the Higher Education Program, Jason Terry. For Human Development and Psychology, Winky Chan. For the International Education Policy Program, Elihan Lankum. For the Language and Literacy Program, Miranda Watros. For the Learning and Teaching Program, Wu Jin Kim. For the Mind, Brain, and Education Program, April Finlinson. From Prevention, Science, and Practice, Naja Turner. From School Leadership, Latrice Lyle. From Special Studies, Kadist Tafase, sorry, Tafaye, excuse me. From Teacher Education, Rachel McGurk. And from Technology, Innovation, and Education, Jalen Parnell. <laughs> and congratulations to our 2019 Marshals. It is now my pleasure to present the Phyllis Strimling Award. This award was created in 2000 to honor Phyllis Strimling, an HGSC alumna from the class of 1989 and the former director of the Radcliffe Seminars Program. I'm also, I am so pleased to welcome Phyllis to today's convocation, as well as Holly Weeks and Rob Scalia, two of the th 
three former Radcliffe Seminars faculty who created the award. Please join me in thanking Phyllis, Holly, and Rob for their support of our students. The Phyllis Strimlin Award recognizes an HGSE student who works to advance society by advancing women, demonstrates inclusive leadership, and is, is, is inspirational to others, promotes community as a management approach, and demonstrates the ability to employ multiple perspectives and sound decision making. This year, the Strimlin Award Committee took the unusual step of awarding two awards. The winners are Isa Ajaz, a master's candidate in education policy and management, and Alexandra Bokarek, a master's candidate in specialized studies. Iza is the daughter of Dr. Shoab Ajaz, a Rubina Shoab, and she is a lawyer whose prior experience includes working as a teacher and administrator in one of the pioneer international baccalaureate schools in Pakistan. During her time in HGSE, Iza's interests included international education and professional development for educators. She worked, on, worked to develop an educational philosophy of a girls' school, which she hopes to one day open in Pakistan. After graduation, Iza also hopes to found a think tank aimed at encouraging Pakistani teachers to produce publishable, publishable research. Iza? And now uh, to talk a little bit about Alexandra. Prior to arriving at HGSC, Alexandra worked with a nonprofit in Nigeria to improve HIV AIDS education. She later volunteered with an organization in Honduras focused on preventing complications during childbirth before going on to complete a medical degree at the Icon School of Medicine at, Ma at Mount Sinai. During her time at HGSC, Alexandra was interested in learning how to improve education and training in order to promote access to reproductive health care. After graduation, she plans to continue her clinical practice and education efforts in her new role as Director of Education in the Women's Health Unit at Boston Medical Center. Alexandra. So we're so pleased to recognize, recognize both Iza and Alexandra for the Phyllis Strimling Award. Please join me in a final round of applause for them. I'd now like to take a moment to thank this year's Student Council. The Student Council, coordinated by Associate Director of Student Affairs, Kevin Bohm, is elected by the HGSE student body at large and represents every academic program at the Ed School. This year's council did ter terrific work. They hosted community building and social events for students, including the extremely successful Yule Ball. A few of you remember that. Created opportunities for students to connect with faculty with coffee with a prof, and supported students in their job search with, jo with a jobs in Java event. Through their event, Ed Talks, they also provided a platform for students to share some of what they've learned this year with their classmates. I ask that the members of the Student Council stand so we can show our appreciation for your service. Thank you again. I would also like to thank this year's cohort of Equity and Inclusion Fellows. The Fellows are coordinated by Tracy Jones, Associate Director, Associate Director of Student Affairs, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. 
This year, the Equity Fellows work to advance the mission of diversity initiatives at HGSE and within the greater Harvard community with racial equity and justice at the core of their work. The 13 Fellows developed and participated in programming throughout the academic year. In addition to the work that they did here at HGSC, they provided training across the university, including at the Harvard Medical School, the Center for Public Leadership at the Harvard Kennedy School, and for the Harvard Law School staff. I ask the fellows to stand so we can show appreciation for your service. Thank you again. And now I return the podium over to Academic Dean and Juliana W. and William Foss Thompson Professor of Education and Society, Noni Lasso, who will introduce this afternoon's faculty speaker. Good afternoon. This is fabulous. I'm delighted to introduce the faculty convocation speaker elected by you, the class of 2019, Professor Tom Hare. We are very proud to call Tom one of ours. He's a graduate of HGSC, having earned his doctorate here in 1990. Throughout his career, Tom has served as an educator, policymaker, and advocate on behalf of individuals with disabilities. He began his work in school districts in Boston and Chicago, serving as, serving as a special education teacher himself and successfully fighting for inclusion and equity for thousands of students. During this time, he worked on a model, a vocational special education program model, which was later rec recognized as a national model. Tom then went on to serve as director of the Office of Special Education Programs in the U.S. Department of Education as part of the Clinton administration in the 1990s. In this role, Tom was responsible for implementing the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, referred to as IDEA, and he played a major role in preparing the administration's reauthorization, guarantee guaranteeing opportunities, and scripting a better future for our nation's six million students with dis special needs who are among our most vulnerable citizens. As some of our own students would say, Tom doesn't just know the law, he wrote the law. Tom returned to HGSE in 1999 and was later named the Silvana and Christopher Pascucci Professor of Practice in Learning Differences. The talents that had so influenced the field of special education have likewise contributed enormously to our HGSE community. He is at once a savvy policymaker, influential scholar, and devoted educator. Tom's influence as a teacher is evidenced by the countless students who flock to his classes, to his office, to learn, to be heard and understood, to be challenged, to be validated, and to be scholars of disability. I'd like to share excerpts from this year's graduating class, all of you, as your words best demonstrate the lasting impact that Tom will have. One student wrote, Tom has consistently reminded us all that disability is natural, equity includes individuals with disabilities, and inclusion is more than an educational concept. It is a state of mind. Another student, he demonstrated to me that you could integrate the researcher, the practitioner, and all of yourself into your work and career. And finally, being in, Tom, in, being in Professor Tom Hare's course was one of, a, one of the most powerful and transformative experiences of my life. Tom officially retired at the end of the fall semester, but his impact will carry on in the countless students many themselves with disabilities, whom he has taught and mentored and who have gone on to be successful school leaders, teachers, policy makers, and first-rate change agents in special education. Tom has taught us all to push for greater equity for all students, to encourage bravery to get to the ideal, and to always, always press hard to close the gap between what we know and what we do. And the world is a better place for it. So please join me in welcoming Tom Hare.
See, I don't know if I need to say anything after that introduction, Noni. <laughs> really. <clears throat> well, greetings, class of 2019. Um, thank you very much for the honor of being your convocation faculty speaker. It really does mean a lot to me. <clears throat> As educators, one of the things we desire most is for our students to remember us. Positively, of course. <laughs> we all have memories of teachers who have had a lasting impact on our lives. Margaret Mead once said, children must be taught how to think, not what to think. That's how I describe the teachers who had a lasting impact on me. And looking back at my life, I have been fortunate to have many fine teachers in the Worcester Public Schools where I grew up. You have to be from Worcester to pronounce it correctly. <laughs> I had many other fine teachers at Holy Cross, Syracuse, U oh, Holy Cross, let's hear it for Holy Cross. Go Crusaders, oh, they're not Crusaders anymore. Um, uh, a good thing. <laughs> Syracuse University <laughs> and Harvard. <laughs> However, one teacher who stood out for me, I never had in class. He was my uncle, a Jesuit priest and educator here for Jesuits. Uh, <laughs> when I was a teenager, he cautioned me to always be skeptical of the dominant frames by which society addresses its perceived problems. That dominant frames can hide oppression and inequality. He related to me how when he was a seminarian in the late 30s, he could recall only one conversation concerning African Americans. And that centered around how they as priests should be converting more African Americans to Catholicism. He told me that was the wrong frame. He decried the lack of attention to racism, discrimination, and Jim Crow. He related how in some parts of the country, African Americans had to receive communion after whites. He was appalled. From his perspective, they were missing the most important issue, the need to confront racism in both society and the church. His lessons about frames has stayed with me throughout my career. As a young special educator, when I was being prepared to teach students with disabilities, one of the dominant themes espoused by many in my field was the theory of normalization. Using this frame, we were taught that our role as special educators was to enable students with disabilities to fit in, to be as normal as possible. That meant that deaf students were often discouraged from signing. I enforced into hours of therapy to read lips and to speak, with many of them never really accomplishing either. While they were denied access to natural language, sign language. Glad you're here today. This is the first, by the way, that we've had an interpreter at convocation. <clears throat> Students with physical disabilities spent hours learning how to take a few steps, often being pulled out of academic classrooms. Dyslexic students were subjected to endless drills in phonics and spelling while being denied access to great literature. Over time, I realized that that was the wrong frame. As Noni said in my introduction, uh, I had the honor of being appointed the director of special education during the Clinton administration. In that role, I worked with other appointees who headed up disability programs. There were about 20 of us, and I was the only one who did not have a disability. When we met monthly to talk about our programs and policies Im impacting the disability community, the email invitation read, disabled appointees plus Tom. <laughs> they were inclusive. <laughs> Though I had worked in special education my entire career, I was never in a position where I, a temporarily able-bodied person, a tab, 
as many in the disability community refer to non-disabled people, was working primarily with people who had disabilities. Now that I'm older, I know how temporary my able-bodiedness was. <laughs> Some of you know that, don't you? Um, this was a great boundary-crossing activity for me. I recall a meeting I had in 1994 in which I brought up a policy issue. The fact that students with disabilities were excluded from state and federal testing. As a country, we could not answer the question, are students with disabilities learning to read? Or are they becoming proficient in mathematics? I thought of this purely as a policy issue. My colleagues had a different frame. My boss, the noted disability ad ad activist, Judy Human, responded, don't you get it, Tom? It's ableism. They, meaning people without disabilities, don't believe we, people with disabilities, are capable. The rest of the group nodded in agreement. I had never heard the term, but quickly figured it out. Like racism, sexism, and homophobia, it is deeply held negative views of people based on group membership, attitudes that discriminate and oppress. This was an epiphany for me. It changed my frame. I saw how many of the practices that I and others in my field engaged in actually perpetuated ableism. Though well-meaning, we educators often focused on deficits, not strengths, and too often, we ignored the unique gifts that students with disabilities brought with them because they had disabilities. The frame of ableism was a direct challenge to the frame of normalization that dominated my field. It became clear to me that we as educators needed to confront ableism just as we need to confront racism, anti-Semitism, sexism, and homophobia. We need to embrace students with disabilities for who they are and move forward to seek a world in which people with disabilities are respected and embraced. Recently, I came into possession of a trove of letters my uncle wrote to my mother and others in my family. As I read these letters that spanned five decades, you know, letters are really good things. People should still write them. Um, I could see how my uncle changed his frames throughout his career. As a young seminarian in India in the late 30s, he thought about his career as converting Hindus and Muslims to Christianity. He enthusiastically accepted this call. However, as his career evolved, it became clear to me that his frames had changed. He, found, he founded a high school and university in Baghdad, Iraq. Al Hikma University. The school not only enrolled Christians of several denominations, but also Muslims, both Sunni and Shia. And when you think about Baghdad today, it might be surprising that 7% of the students in the school were Jewish. And in a radical move for its time and place, the school enrolled women. His letters never talked about conversion but rather he spoke of the beauties of Islam. Another letter he wrote concerned a boat trip he took from Europe shortly after World War II. Holocaust survivors heading to Israel mostly populated the ship. My uncle marveled at their faithfulness um, in, in, as they celebrated Shabbat, given all they had been through. He spoke of his deep respect for Judaism and the Jewish people. As I, reached, as I researched his school more, it was evident that my missionary uncle did not seem interested in converting anyone. None other than the powerful Cardinal of Boston, Cardinal Cushing, publicly criticized the Jesuits in Iraq for not converting a single person, calling their vocations wasted. However, another article I found written by a Muslim, part of the Iraqi diaspora here in the United States, provided a counter-narrative. He spoke glowingly of the school, remembering how transformative it was 
to be educated alongside Christians and Jews. He stated that for him, this was America. Saddam Hussein closed the school in 1968, expelling the American Jesuits. Clearly, their frame of acceptance of difference conflicted with his political philosophy of pitting one group against another, as fascists typically do. However, the example of Al Hikma University, of a school being a place where difference was acknowledged and celebrated, where boundaries were crossed for the betterment of all, is as relevant today as it was in the 50s and 60s. It was and continues to be the right frame. So class of 2019, be the educators your students remember by teaching them how to think, not what to think. Be the educator who recognizes the power of education to cross boundaries. Being, be the educator willing to question dominant frames as you promote equity inclusion for the betterment of all. Thank you very much and congratulations. Thank you so much, Tom, for sharing those words, and thank you for being the faculty speaker for the 2019 convocation. I would now like to introduce our student speaker, Faith Young. Faith is a master's candidate in our international education policy program and a native of Hong Kong. Prior to HTSC, Faith attended the University of Cambridge, where she earned a bachelor's degree in law. While at HTSC, Faith's interests included the use of data analytics to drive policy making, which she was able to explore through her work at the Center for Education Policy Research as part of their Proving Ground initiative. Following graduation, Faith plans to return home to Hong Kong and, in, and obtain her professional license as a lawyer before working in education policy. Faith has chose, was chosen by our selection committee of faculty, staff, and students to be this year's student speaker. Please join me in welcoming her. Dean Long, our admired faculty members, distinguished guests, parents, friends, and my wonderful cohort, good afternoon. Nine months ago, I was sitting under this very canopy for orientation day. Having just spent 10 minutes trying to find an entrance into Longfellow Hall that was unlocked, <laughs> I was feeling uncertain about a lot of things and certain about very little. I was certain I felt overwhelmed. Dean Long had just announced that at 21 years of age, I was one of the youngest people sitting under that canopy faced with teachers, principals, superintendents, and education leaders who have spent years, if not decades, in the field. What did I have to contribute as a fresh-faced college graduate? Today, as I bid farewell to my time at Hugsy, I'm still feeling uncertain about a lot of things, but I'm certain there are three lessons that Hugsy, as a school, as an experience and as an endeavor has managed to teach us. And I'm certain these are lessons we will carry for the rest of our lives because for each and every one of us who is graduating today, education is life itself. Before I move on, I want to answer a question that I've received for countless times throughout this year. Why is our graduate school of education called Hugsy? If I was in a rush that day, I would give the honest answer. It's a thing. But if I had more time on my hands, I would give the unexpected answer. It's because we like hugs. But if I wanted all of us to walk out of this canopy today with an indelible impression of three lessons that Hugsy has taught us, I would give this answer. We are called H-G-S-E because this 
is a school that humbles. This is a school that galvanizes. This is a school that stands for equity. It is not difficult to imagine the humility I felt when faced with faculty who have dedicated their lives to paradigm shifting research or schoolmates who have left the comfort of their own homes to educate children suffering in conflict. But the lesson that will stay with us is we are a school that humbles. I stepped into this school having been a student all my life and was greeted with the respect and interest for my professors and my classmates that I've always yearned for but never expected. Humility, I've learned, is even more valuable when it comes from the powerful, the knowledgeable, and the decorated, who are always striving to improve themselves and who understand that every person has a worthy story, young or old, man or woman, you or me. Last semester, an alumnus on the entrepreneurship panel of Professor Higgins' class said, your mind will never race as fast as it does in this school. Indeed, this is a school that galvanizes. Maybe it was a sentence in one of your readings that answered a cry in your heart you thought no one else heard. Or maybe it was the dichotomy that you debated with a friend in Gutman Cafe until you both realized there was a third solution. The point is, while the injustices that perpetuate our education systems may continue to daunt us, we are no longer paralyzed. Instead, this school has galvanized our minds to enter the race of a lifetime, the race to keep the spark of inspiration alive and to keep this desire to serve our students burning. Now, for the third and most important lesson, this is a school that stands for equity. One thing that I learned in law school as an undergraduate in the UK is, when in doubt, define. Today, I venture myself as the definition of the equity this school stands for. Before you is an Asian young woman. Instead of telling me that on the path to improve education for all, I have to forget the fact that I am Asian young and female. My mentors and my peers have stood by me as I came to recognize that my passion for education was ignited by the mounting student suicides in the Asian city I love and call home. They have stood by me as I came to recognize that my age, my gender, and my personality shape a vision for the education of future generations in Hong Kong and beyond. So as we embark on our mission to change the world through education, I pray that we can do the same for our students. Let us see each student as he or she is. Let us be the torch bearers who share the dream of igniting each student's path to quality education. Class of 2019, may we stay humble stay galvanized, stand for equity, and stay hugsy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Faith, and congratulations on being chosen to be the student speaker for the 2019 convocation. I would now like to invite the chair of this year's class gift campaign, Rachel Eisner, to join me. Rachel is a master's candidate in the Education Policy and Management Program. She chaired a class gift committee of 24 ed school students, and together, the committee worked hard to support a critical priority for HGSC, financial aid for our incoming class of students. Thank you all who have worked with Rachel and to everyone who gave. And now Rachel's gonna tell you a little bit more about the 2019 class gift campaign. To Dean Long, faculty and staff, 
friends and family, and my fellow colleagues of the class of 2019. I am very grateful to have been able to serve as the chair of this year's class gift campaign. Contributing to the class gift is an act of generosity that helps to strengthen both the current and future communities of HGSE students. And I am extremely proud of the contributions we as a class have made to the financial aid for the class of 2020. This year, we were able to raise $14,471.24 with over 50% of our class meetings participating in this year's campaign. I want to give a huge shout out to Language and Literacy for achieving 100% participation for the first time in their cohort's history. <laughs> and second, I would be remiss if I didn't recognize the 27 Class Gift Committee members for their leadership within their cohorts and true commitment to the campaign. And finally, I want to thank all of you individually who contributed to this year's campaign. It's not an easy thing to find the personal and financial resources to give during a time when many have had to make more than a few sacrifices to get to this moment we are at today. Whether it meant taking out additional loans, traveling far from places that are familiar, and sometimes far from those we love, or staying in the same city but entering a new chapter of life, we all have already given a great deal in order to graduate from the Harvard Graduate School of Education. But we have also each received a gift at one point or another that made this moment possible. Whether it was a family member, friend, mentor who nourished our growth, a teacher or professor that believed in our potential, a former student who fueled our drive to go back to school, or a classmate who challenged and supported our growth here, we rely on the generosity of others. Though our time at graduate school has come to an end, we will always be connected both to HGSC and to each other. As graduates of this program, we all have been charged with being leaders. While some of us will go on to lead classrooms, organizations, and even movements, I hope that we will all continue to be leaders in promoting the gift of generosity that is increasingly more and more important in the divisive world we will now re-enter. This generosity starts within our own communities, of which HGSC will now forever be a part. The HGSC alumni community is a gift in itself, one we should treasure, and one that we must continue to cultivate even as we all go our separate ways. And now, I didn't plan this well, so I'm gonna go run and grab it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rachel, and thank you to all of you for the class gift committee and, again, everyone who gave for such an important, important uh, thing to contribute to the class that will be coming here next year. I really appreciate your hard work and your service to the school. And now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce the chair of the Alumni Council, Hannah rodriguez Farrar who will be presenting the 2019 Alumni Award for Outstanding Contribution to Education. Hannah earned her EDM from HGSE in 2005 and her EDD in 2013, and I had the pleasure of working very closely with her. She brings a wealth of experience in higher education and alumni engagement to the council. Hannah has held senior administrative positions at Brown University, Dominican University, and she is currently the chief of staff to President Brian Casey at Colgate University. I want to thank Hannah and the rest of the Alumni Council for their hard work this year and their continue, continued dedication to HGSE's mission. Please join me in welcoming Hannah. Dr. Stella Flores. And thank you, Rachel, for mentioning the alumni, because you guys are now part of this community. So welcome to the Alumni Council, and welcome to the HGC alumni community. Um, the 2019 Alumni Council Award goes to an amazing pr uh, professor at NYU, Dr. Stella Flores, who got her uh, master's here in 2002 and her, P and her EDD in 2007. She's a deeply respected scholar and champion of diversity and equity. Dr. Flores, has devoted her career to improving college access and success 
for undergraduate, uh, underrepresented and low income students. Flores is a associate professor for higher education at the Steinhardt uh, School of Culture, Education and Human Development at New York University, where she also serves as associate dean for faculty development and diversity and director of access and equity at the Steinhardt Institute for Higher Ed. Using quantitative methods to examine large scale data, data, um, databases in grades K through 20, Dr. Flores investigates the impact of state and federal policy on college access and completion for underserved student populations. She has made important contributions to the literature on immigrant and English language learner students, minority serving institutions, and affirmative action in higher ed. Notably, her scholarship has been cited in the dissenting opinion in the 2003 U.S. Supreme Court Graps versus Bollinger decision. As an academic leader, Flores has been steadfastly committed to conducting rigorous and relevant research that can catalyze improvements in institutional, state, federal policy and practice. For these and other profound contributions and future ed contributions to education, it is with great respect and a lot of honor on my part, because she's a friend of mine, to bestow the 2019 HGSE Alumni Council Award upon Dr. Stella Flores. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you, Hannah, and thank you, Stella. Thank you for outstanding work on issues related to access and equity as a scholar, as a researcher, as a leader in education, as a mentor, and as a friend. I join many, many people who are very proud of you and are thankful for your dedication and the future work that you will do. Thank you. And so now it is my honor and pleasure to welcome our convocation speaker, Deborah Ball. What? Deborah Beal, sorry. What? Sorry, <laughs> my cold medicine is getting to me. <laughs> Deborah Beal. So before I tell you about Debbie, and, uh, and if you heard her uh, piping up here, we're old friends. Uh, um, so before I tell you about her extraordinary work as founder of the Posse Foundation, I should mention, Debbie, that I actually do talk about you quite a bit. When people ask me, what do graduates of HGSE go on and do? You're one of the first people who comes to mind. I could say, well, you know, as a student, you could go off and then start a nonprofit, win a MacArthur Genius Award, and become a nationally recognized advocate for college student success and access. And let me tell you, that usually impresses people. But it's also a tremendous example of what we mean when we say that our graduates can change the world through education. Debbie had already dreamed up the idea of Posse before she came here to HCSC in 1995. But it was here where she refined her ideas and as she, as, as she earned her master's degree in 1996 and her EDD in 2004. The story goes that when she was working as a youth counselor in New York City, one of her students who had dropped out of college came back to her and said that he would have stayed in school if he had had his posse to support him. And from this grew an idea, invite the most promising but underrepresented students to join a posse or a group of 10 students to prepare for and enter a selective college or university. And together, they would support each other in the theory that that would help them thrive in college. Posse rece posses receive leadership training and scholarship funds, setting them up for success even after they graduate college. And the Posse Foundation is now celebrating its 30th anniversary and has grown to work in 10 cities and partner with 58 colleges and universities. There are now more than 9,200 scholars and alumni in the Posse Network, including an alumna who's the current president of Ithaca College. Posse scholars have an incredible success rate, with 90% of them graduating from college. And thanks to Debbie's vision, Posse students not only graduate from college, but they truly thrive. 80% of the 2017 Posse scholars served as officers in student organizations at their colleges, and 20 Posse scholars have served as a student body president at their colleges. 
and their students go on to become civic and business leaders in their own communities and beyond. These young people, armed with a college education and bright futures, go on to touch many more lives. And this is the power of Debbie's model, but I don't have to tell you all that education can change the world. Debbie is well known in the field as a trailblazer and a fierce advocate for disadvantaged students. She is a recipient of seven honorary degrees from colleges such as Brandeis, Colby, and Mount Holyoke. She won the McGraw Prize in Education, HGSE's Ann Rowe Award, and the aforementioned MacArthur Genius Award. And most recently, Posse was named as one of 10 foundations chosen to receive a portion of President Obama's Nobel Prize Award. I know you are all anxious to hear from Debbie, but I need to take a moment to recognize her for one more thing, and that is her willingness to give back to the community here on Appian Way. Debbie has co-taught a course at HGSE on education entrepreneurship with faculty member Jim Honan, and has been a frequent guest in many of the higher education classes, spending time with students and alumni here. Faculty member Judy McLaughlin has said that she is an inspiration for students, reminding them of what they can, too, accomplish. I'm thrill thrilled that she is here now to speak with all of you who are going to be leaving to change the world through education. Please join me in welcoming Debbie. Could we, hi, could we have a round of applause for Dean Long for completing her first year as Dean of the Ed School? This, this school is so lucky to have Bridget Terry Long as its dean. She is committed, you know what I'm talking about. She is committed from her heart. And this school is, is really better off for it, for it. So thank you for inviting me at the end of your first year. It's an honor. So congratulations, everybody. Tomorrow's the big day. You feel good? You look good. You look good. I want to thank all of you for inviting me. I want to thank the distinguished faculty, the Hugsy staff, the alumni, all of you for including me. It's really an honor when you come back to your alma mater. So it feels extra special to be here. Um, you know, you're already distinguished, all of you. You're already teachers and principals and superintendents and policymakers and entrepreneurs. You're all already that. So as that, all of us, really, we have a special responsibility, right? We need to be extra super hyper responsible and aware of the political and social issues that affect our lives today and of course affect our futures because we teach and guide and nurture and create infrastructure and build context for young people. They rely on us. You all remember what it was like being a kid, a little kid. We each had our own dreams and anxieties. I grew up in a suburb of New York City in Teaneck, New Jersey, in a white house, literally, with a red door and a white picket fence. There was a lot of it that was kind of stereotypically middle class. I, I remember playing on the block where my house was with other kids, and I, I never wandered too far from my house. In fact, I would periodically run back to my mom to hug her legs. She called it refueling. And then on the first day of kindergarten, I didn't want my mom to leave me there in Mrs. Garfunkel's class. So I cried. I had separation anxiety. And I also had separation anxiety when I left for college. I cried. I didn't want to leave my mom and my dad and my sister and my dog. I didn't want to leave Winthrop Road. But I always had a little separation anxiety. Separating just made me nervous. Leaving made me immediately romanticize what I was leaving behind. I worried a lot. You know, what, what might I be losing? Well, something similar happens on a societal level. 
we as adults have a kind of separation anxiety if something challenges our traditional ways of life. We worry about separating from things that make us comfortable. And not just from moms or dads, houses and beds, not just from streets and towns, but from ideas and habits. The problem is some of our ideas and habits are not good. It's easy to think about the special familial homey things that we don't want to leave behind. We even work hard to replicate them when we build our own homes. I remember I, I grew up using uh, Crest toothpaste, and my husband grew up using Colgate, and now we have a tube of each in our bathroom. <laughs> I mean, change is hard, and, and sometimes we just don't do it. But some things need to be changed. There are habits and situations and circumstances that need to change, and in order to make those necessary changes, we need to take a step back, separate ourselves from the things that we've become accustomed to, and I'm especially talking about the need to separate from some of the inexcusable societal routines we've got so used to, from racism, from misogyny, from the psychic numbing that allows us to kind of casually walk by a homeless person on the street with a feed me sign. We need to make a conscious effort to look at our society in a reasonably objective way to determine for ourselves what is worth keeping and what is harmful and destructive. It is our job as educators, as people who work with children, to separate ourselves from what has become routine, a world of unfairness and inequality that can get reinforced in our classrooms and then in our boardrooms. As a society, I, I'm, I'm saying we have become impervious, desensitized, and numb, and we have to change, because if we do not change, we stand to lose everything. I'm going to explain this. We have become impervious to the warnings of scientists all over the world about global warming. And, and you might have read Bill McKibben's piece in a New Yorker article. We have killed off 60% of the world's wildlife since 1970 by destroying their habitats. We've watched as 100 million trees died in the state of California in 10 years because of drought. We, we are actually right now in danger of standing by as a United States president uses the power of his presidency to assemble a panel to undermine the research on climate change and global warming. We have become desensitized on our college campuses around the country. We're facing expressions of hatred and bigotry. There are, for example, swastikas on bathroom walls, anti-Muslim slurs on dorm room doors, the N-word written in, camp in common spaces. You may all know the story of an African-American female student who was elected student president at her university, the first black female student government president at her school. And later, students woke to find bananas hanging from nooses around campus. We have become numb. Almost one third of all Americans are living in poverty or what we call near poverty. That's a hundred million people. A hundred million people. This should be a crisis of epic proportions and our hearts should ache that a country of such wealth could have so many experiencing such suffering. The truth is, my generation has left a mess for young people. We got complacent, impervious, desensitized, numb. And the reasons are complicated, but I believe that a big part of it was that we didn't take a step back to assess and then decide in the most uncompromising, definitive way to sever ourselves from that which we know is wrong. And in a society that today is operating in triple time, consuming sound bites and video bites like they're M&Ms, we just forgot or forget to stop and pay attention to the mess. So we have to change. 
I'm, there's no shortage of issues we can point to. In our field alone, we struggle with teacher pay, bullying, overcrowded classrooms, and funding. In a country where we can't agree to restrict access to guns, we end up putting metal detectors and actual police in our schools. We schedule drills to protect kids in the event of an active shooter. We grapple with the abuses of privilege, with the admission scandal, and wonder if an adversity score will help address the monstrous challenges of access and equity in higher education. These issues directly affecting our work in education are not the only ones we must focus on. The inequities are all around us in our world at large. They affect how we teach, how we set policy, how we make administrative decisions, how we support the healthy development of young people. We are living in the most diverse United States in history. Non-Hispanic whites will no longer be the majority within the next few decades. And in fact, in our biggest cities, that is already the case. And yet we don't see that diversity reflected in leadership positions in the workforce, right? I mean, how is it that today in 2019, the United States Senate is 90% white and only 30% women? These are our representatives. 83% of the presidents of four-year colleges are white. Only 30% are women. And education is a field dominated by women. Of the 500 people who are CEOs of our biggest companies, you all know this, less than 5% are women. I once went to a CEO conference as a CEO. I was sitting in a session, and the leader asked us to go around the table and introduce ourselves. I was the only woman in the room. They passed the microphone. The mic came around to the man next to me on my right. He introduced himself, and then he passed the mic around me to the man on my left. We as a society must change. We must change so that electing a black president, a woman president, a differently abled president, an openly gay president is nothing special. We must change so that we don't confuse fear-mongering with patriotism, walls with safety, and manipulators with leaders. If, if distancing, if separating, if severing ourselves from these things is radical, then it is time for us to be radical. We must step back, give ourselves perspective. Static routines and habits are ill-suited for the ever-changing environments we all live in. We need to co find comfort, not in what, what is routine or habitual, but in the idea of change as an opportunity for something better, because it is the idea that we can change that should give us hope. You are graduating into a world with tremendous challenges, but I know you already have a higher set of expectations or you wouldn't be here. You are going to hold us all accountable, and I thank you for that, and frankly, that gives me hope. You are a talented, sparkling group of individuals who now has benefited from having met one another, from having studied with Bob Peterkin and Nancy Hill, with Eleanor Duckworth, with Josephine Kim, with Robert Gonzalez and Dick Elmore. The list of good brains here is long. For me, it made an enormous difference. Gary Orfield taught me how to think about integration and civil rights in current time. Derek Bach helped me define merit as much more than a test score and to stand up to anti-affirmative action rhetoric. Judy McLaughlin helped me think about leadership and education and how college and university presidents can most effectively do their jobs. 
I constantly refer to Jim Honan's lectures and materials on organizational structure and nonprofit management. And Julie Rubin gave me the background to understand how student engagement and student protests over history have influenced where we are today, but more importantly, what is possible for tomorrow. We are students of education. Now what we do with that is what matters most. We need inspired leadership. We need bravery. And now we're all out there together. We have to do what's right. From now on, you're part of this big Hugsy network. Today or tomorrow or 10 years from tomorrow, you can pick up the phone and call anybody in our network and we will answer the call, right? Right. <laughs> it's pretty powerful if you think about it. I, I think sometimes it feels impossible to know how to make a difference. You need to care. You need to vote. You need to do what feels radical sometimes. And that might mean standing up for just one person who has been marginalized, victimized, or underrepresented. I'm going to just tell you one more story about something you can do, everyone in this room can do. And if everyone in this room does it, it's going to change the world for sure. You need to become a table pounder. I'm going to explain. Not that long ago, I was in a room with 50 Posse alumni. They were with the, the former CEO, recent former CEO of Deloitte, Kathy Engelbert. One Posse alum raised her hand and she asked Kathy, she said, you're a woman, how did you get to be the CEO of a Fortune 500 company? And Kathy said, I'll tell you how. You have to work hard. You have to find the right mentors. And there has to be someone who will pound the table for you. And let me tell you what I mean by that, she said. I worked hard. I found good mentors, but there was also an executive who, when the door was closed, would pound the table and say, you know, have you thought about Kathy? Kathy's someone to consider. You know, have you considered Kathy? Kathy, Kathy, Kathy. And Kathy became the CEO of Deloitte. You should all work hard, and you should all find mentors. And maybe there was someone who pounded the table for you. But each of you, with this Hugsy degree in your hand, this incredible network around you can pound the table for someone else. Right? Right. Sarah Osman and Ivy Sokol, you can pound the table. Right? <laughs> Daniel Hack and Yu Wang, Mariah Lewis, you are going to pound the table. Drew Edwards, Nell Weber, Jason Terry, you can pound the table. If each of you becomes a table pounder for someone else, for just one person, that will make all the difference. We are in a field that gives us power, power to influence how people understand the world. We can help young people see the absurdities of bigotry, and we can inspire them to lead differently when they grow up. They can and should be leaders who understand that they are better, stronger, more effective when they consider race and gender and class and privilege in every single decision that gets made. From hiring to project assignments, it all matters. We must fight, fight for that which we believe to be fair and just, and that means we must fight for one another. So you must challenge yourself to never feel too comfortable. Sit on the edge of that seat, ready to stand up for someone else and to take the leap yourself. It might cause a little anxiety, but you are the person. You are the people to do it. And together, you are an army with the power of your convictions to 
act decisively, I know you're going to change the world. And we really need you to do that. Thank you. So we have now made it to the end of the 2019 convocation ceremony, and I have just a few closing announcements. I want to again make sure that we thank the Office of Student Affairs for coordinating all of the commencement activities. Alex Galindo, Kevin Bohm, Tracy Jones. And Andrea Lee, thank you so much and to so many others who've helped out to make this week be fantastic. Now, to all of the students, be sure that you are ready on Appian Way tomorrow promptly, promptly, at 7.20 a.m. tomorrow morning for the university commencement exercises. Sorry, I didn't set the schedule. Uh, I have also been asked to remind you to bring your Harvard IDs with you because you're going to need them during the day. When we get over to the yard, I will present you to President Bacow, and your job, I hinted about this earlier, is to make lots and lots and lots of noise, okay? Be sure to make lots of noise. HCSC is always uh, one of the loudest schools, and I want to make sure that we represent tomorrow. Finally, I would like to extend an invitation to all of our graduates as well as their family and friends to attend the block party on Appian Way that's going to start as soon as I stop speaking. And for that reason, I'm going to wrap this up. Um, and I'll say, have a few words to say to you tomorrow at tomorrow's, tomorrow's ceremony. But thank you and congratulations again.